got going to have people uh, filtering in here, so uh, we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, if you would open your uh, book to page 157, um, while you find that page, just a couple, just a couple things. First off, next Sunday uh, we will not have this. We will not meet during this hour. Okay. The following Sunday, two weeks from today, Brother Fred has uh, requested to teach. So Brother Fred's going to teach twice. He's going to teach two weeks from today and then the following Sunday. And then the first Sunday in September, Nate is going to teach. I think that's like the third or I don't remember what it is, third, second, third, something like that. And then the Sunday, September 9, we'll be resuming the class uh, on issues related to the Bible. Um, we're going to be uh, starting off talking about things about canonicity and the transmission of the text uh, throughout history. So that's what we're going to be looking at uh, when we resume that. So just to schedule again, no class next week, two weeks from today, and then the following week Fred is going to teach. First Sunday in, in September, Nate is going to teach, and then September 9, we're going to be resuming the class <clears throat> on the Bible. So just be aware of those things. So that means today is our last lesson on this series about tactics, becoming a 21st century ambassador. So um, again, I, I mentioned this to you last Sunday. There's been a lot of, there, not a lot, but there's been some steady um, interest uh, that I've received through Facebook messages and some emails uh, that have been coming into the church's website about what we've been doing here this summer with this. And uh, some people have asked some questions about how they can obtain the materials, the DVD, the study guide, and different things. And so there's, there's been some interest in you know, kind of what we've been doing. I know it's been different. It hasn't obviously been Bible study, but it's been um, more about how to engage people in that in conversation, right? Moving from content to conversation is what we've been talking about. So we have one lesson left. Um, there are some in the book. There's a few more uh, tactics in the book, but they're pretty short and they're, they're really not necessarily anything new. And so the video curriculum only is going to stop with Steamroller. It's not going to cover uh, Road Scholar, uh, uh, Just the Facts, or uh, More Sweat, Less Blood. And I did reread the last three chapters this week, and I've decided that we're just going to stop where he stops with the video curriculum here with Steamroller. So on page 157, uh, if you would look at that page quick, he says, very few people quickly admit that their beliefs are wrong. Some put up a real fight when your points are reasonable and your manner is gracious. Did you ever wonder why people do that? Why do people ignore good arguments? I think there are four different reasons for resistance and I would like to explain what those are. Then I will give you a step-by-step -step plan to deal with that overconfident, overbearing, and often overwhelming interrupter I call a steamroller. In chapter 2, I talked about the importance of arguments, not angry squabbles or silly quarrels, but points of view buttressed with reasons. Jesus used them, Paul used them, Peter used them, we should use them too. When arguments are done well, they honor God. Good arguments have limits, they don't always work. When that happens, some people are tempted to think that arguments themselves are useless. This is a mistake. If you are searching for that perfect line of logic capable of subduing any objection, you're wasting your time. There is no magic, no, no magic, no silver bullet, no clever turn of thought or phrase that's guaranteed to, com guaranteed to compel belief. That's true. Okay, You can say everything exactly correct. You can have all of your points of doctrine. You can have all the points be absolutely true. They could all be correct. They could all be assembled in the correct order. They could, you could do everything right and tell somebody, share the gospel, share any uh, point related to you know, uh, faith in Christ, the Bible, a, a right division, all of that stuff. You can do everything correct and still not get a favorable what? Response, right? Uh, and that's just the way people are. Whoops. But rational appeals, I skipped something. Oops, yes. Rash, uh, Bible 157, yes, rational reasons can be a barrier to belief. The Christian message simply does not make sense to everyone, or it raises questions 
or counter, uh, counter examples that make it difficult for people to even consider Christianity until those issues are addressed. But rational appeals often fail to persuade for other reasons. At least three additional reasons may compel the person you're talking to to ignore your point. They have nothing to do with clear thinking, even when, you're, even when objections based on reason are the first to surface, if your thoughtful response fails to have an impact, it's, uh, it's not acknowledged or worse, doesn't seem to have been noticed, maybe one of these reasons is lurking in the shadows. Okay? First, people have emotional reasons to resist. Your logic is very rarely going to overcome their emotion. Which is why politicians use emotion, not logic, to try to get people to agree with them. Think about the, the political ads, the different things that you see going on. They are almost, almost always an appeal to emotion. Okay, not logic. Because people, the vast majority of people are far more emotional than they are what? Logical. Okay, so sometimes people are going to have emotional reasons why. Okay. Halfway down the page. Second, some bulk because of prejudice. Their minds are already made up. It's not going to matter what you say about the resurrection. They're already prejudiced that there is no resurrection and that science is the only source of truth. And so they might, you might have everything correct. You might say all the right things. You might use all the right verses. You have everything the way you're supposed to have it, but they're not going to want. They're not going to believe. Okay. And then at the bottom, finally, some people are just plain pig-headed. Okay, their real reason for resistance is no more elegant or sophisticated than simple rebellion. And that's true too, right? So you're going to have people that are going to, you're going to encounter emotional reasons why people, so let, let's just look at the four. One would be volitional, right? They, their will is not such to believe, right? And that could be because of prejudice, that could be because of emotion, that could be because of a lot of different reasons. Um, sometimes you're going to deal with an intellect, someone who is truly has an intellectual block, okay? And then you're going to deal with the, per, the type of person that he's going to uh, explain in this video who he calls a steamroller. The person that is just going to try to overwhelm you by the force of their personality and their use of just the peppering of questions to try to, to, try to you know, intimidate you into accepting their version of why what they believe is true okay so as before we get into the video here does anybody have any questions thoughts or comments about that introduction okay so let's see what he says about steamroller again there's a couple spots where i'll stop it and we'll have some discussion Well, here we are, our final session with our tactics training. Um, it's been a lot of fun for me. I, I hope you've enjoyed it as well. Uh, this last session is going to teach you a very, very important tactic that you're going to need to defend yourself against a certain type of person. We'll dis discuss that in just a moment. But first, I'd like to talk about what we covered last session, okay? We learned the basics of a tactic that I call taking the roof off. It's one I got from Francis Schaefer. He's the one who actually named it. There are three steps to this tactic. First, we accept the other person's point of view, their basic viewpoint or their basic uh, um, view or argument. For the sake of argument, we acknowledge it. We say, okay, if that's true, then what? We then give the idea a mental test drive, okay? We, we see where it would logically lead to see if there's any absurd consequences that result when the view is uh, applied consistently, okay? And if there are absurd consequences that maybe that person isn't aware of, we take the roof off. We remove their protection and we invite them to consider the implications of their own view. And we also learned a little bit about why this tactic works. And this is a concept from Schaefer that has helped me in a lot of other, other areas. That human beings actually are made in the image of God. And they actually do live in the world that God created. And that means that everyone who denies the, the, the fact of Christianity and the Christian worldview will have views that will also contradict reality, which creates a problem for them. They're living in a world that is one way, but they have beliefs that say something else. And so there's going to be a point of tension when those 
beliefs they have and reality collide with each other. And part of your job using the taking the roof off tactic is to, is to, uh, is to cause those things to collide, to help them to see that they cannot live out their view given the way the world actually is. And that oftentimes they're borrowing from our worldview in order to make points that are inconsistent with their own. So we remove the roof, the shield that they've erected to protect themselves from the logical implications of their beliefs. And uh, we deprive them of this false sense of security that they have. That's taking the roof off. And when we do it, we always try to use, you know, questions whenever we can do that. Today I want to teach you a defensive tactic. Now I'll call it steamroller. Steamroller is a tactic that will help you handle one of the most difficult kinds of people that you run into. So here's what we're going to do. First I will teach you how to recognize a steamroller and I guarantee you that is not hard. <laughs> Second I want to teach you three basic steps that you can use uh, to help you kind of stop a steamroller and hopefully puts you back in control of the conversation. Okay, Steamrollers are the hardest kinds of people for me to deal with. I'll just tell you, if I ever break my rule about getting angry, you know, if I get mad, I lose. Well, sometimes I break my rule. Not on purpose, but I get mad. It's usually because I'm dealing with a steamroller. So sometimes they're really hard to deal with. But if you do not deal with the steamroller, you will get nowhere else in the conversation. And in fact, even after you do deal with them, you'll see you might not get anywhere else. But at least now we, we have a way to deal with them, and I'll share that with you. Um, simply put, steamrollers are people who overwhelm you. All right, They have strong opinions. They have strong personalities. And they mean to keep you off balance and on the defensive by overpowering you with a lot of attitude and a lot of noise, okay? Their words come fast and furious and they keep you from collecting your thoughts. You can't catch your wits and answer in a thoughtful manner. Uh, and they have one defining characteristic. They interrupt constantly. They will cut you off before you can respond to the challenge. Uh, as you're trying to respond to the challenge, in the middle of your answer, they'll take you in a totally different direction. They'll find something they don't like in your explanation. They'll jump right in and then pile on more challenges. And then you end up following the second or the third or the fourth challenge, but that doesn't work because they're going to interrupt you and stop you and send you in another direction. You'd never get anything done. They change the subject. They overwhelm you with, with um, all kinds of attitude and all kinds of noise, and they never listen to anything you have to say. Now, if this description sounds familiar, I bet you've been steamrollered. Some of you are married to steamrollers, you know. That could be really rough. But the technique I'm going to teach you to deal with the steamroller works with anyone, all right? Here's one of the problems with dealing with a steamroller. Uh, steamrollers are insincere people. That is, they know it's easier to ask the hard questions than it is to listen to the hard answers. The questions can come fast. The answers sometimes are slower because they're, they're more involved. You have to cover more ground with them. And these are people who do not want to wait and listen because they don't really want an answer. What they want to do is just make you look foolish, overpower you, okay? They're not interested in answers. They're interested in winning through power and intimidation. Now, every once in a while, you run into somebody that I call a benevolent steamroller. That is, they're not really mean or nasty. They're just overly excitable, and they, they just can't wait to, to get into, the, into play. And, and they're, they're not listening to you. They're thinking about what they want to say. And once you stop talking, boom, they're jumping in. Or maybe they're cutting you off. And so they're still hard to deal with, but they're not quite as difficult as the other time. And there is a way to deal with steamrollers. There are three steps for dealing with them. I'll tell you quickly what they are, and, uh, and then I'll explain them. You stop them, you shame them, or finally, you leave them. Okay? Now, these are progressive steps, and the point is that if you do the first step and it works to stop the steamroller, you don't have to go any further. If the first step doesn't work, you go to the second step. If you can't stop them, then you shame them. And if neither of those work and they keep rolling over the top of you, you leave them. That's the idea, 
All right. So let's look at the first step. When somebody begins to steamroll you, interrupt you while you're talking, the best thing you can do is to try to stop them graciously but firmly and in a very modest way negotiate an agreement. And many times that's all you need to do to be able to move forward. And I find myself when I'm in stage one that I, I actually use a little body English so I hold my hand up. So we're talking together and as I'm trying to respond, they jump right in and I'll say, wait, wait just a minute. I'm, I'm not quite finished yet. I'll give you a chance to jump in. Let me finish my thought. Is that all right? You notice how friendly that was, how uh, kind of easy it was. I'm smiling when I say it. I say at the end, is that all right? I put my hand up a little bit. I'm not being really mean and gruff. Will you please let me finish? No, that's not going to work. All right. You just do that simple thing. Oh, hold on just a minute. I'm not quite finished yet. I'll, I'll let you talk in a second. And this, I'll let you talk in a second, is really valuable and helpful because you're letting them know they'll have their turn. Okay? Uh, but you need to finish up what you have to say to make the point that answers whatever their challenge is, and then you give the floor back to them. I would say probably 85% of the time when you have a steamroller, and this is especially true with a benevolent steamroller, not really mean, but just overly excitable, um, that's all that you're going to need to do. And with the benevolent steamrollers, I say, hey, hold on just a second. I'm not quite finished. And they go, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, 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 oh. And they're all excited because they want to jump in. I say, yeah, but you got to slow down a little bit and be sure you're listening to what I say, okay? All right, here's what I have to say. And then it'll be your turn. That's all it takes. Okay, so that's step number one. Very, very uh, simple, very straightforward, easy to do. Now, keep in mind, you have to keep your cool when this happens. Because I think the first, the first response that that I feel and most people feel when they're cut off is defensive and aggressive okay uh, we might say you know hold on just for a minute I need a little bit more time you asked a good question um, you deserve an answer are you interested in what I have to say that kind of thing you know so you might might spread it out a little bit but it's just an, an appeal for enough courtesy to let you finish your point and then it's their turn okay um, now, if, if the steamroller is especially aggressive, uh, sometimes it's best just to stop talking <laughs> for a few moments and just calmly wait for a clear opening. What you don't want to do is you don't want to talk over them. If he's not cooperating, just let him go, okay? So basically, you're asking him to give you something, which is patience, so that you can give him something in return, and that's a, a response to your to his question or to his challenge. Okay, so that's the way this is working. So, for example, you might say, um, "Is it okay with you if I take a few moments to answer your concerns or your questions before you ask another question? Is that okay with you? Because uh, I need some time. Uh, I'll give you a chance to respond when I get done." Or you might say, "I know you have a lot of questions, but I need a moment to explain myself. Is that okay?" Or you might say something like, um, let me respond to your first challenge. When I'm done, you can jump in, in again. Is that all right with you? Or you might say, uh, that's a good question and it deserves a decent answer. I need a moment to give you one. Is that okay? Uh, notice that I'm asking for permission every single time. That is, I, I, I negotiate an agreement to let me talk before he talks again, and I ask him if that's okay. And if he says, yeah, that's okay, well, now you've done your job, and you can respond. But be sure to respond adequately to the first issue, to one issue, before you're for forced to tackle another. And this is what I mean about the insincerity that you run into with, with um, steamrollers sometimes. They, they, they're not listening. They just want to bam, 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 and throw this out. And so you gotta slow them down, you got to stop them. That's the first step. You stop them and you negotiate. And then will that work out for you? Okay. Doesn't have to be long. Could be just a few seconds like I showed you. And uh, once you've made your point, you can ask him to acknowledge uh, the point you made. So you give him the point and you can say, okay, is that a fair answer to your question? 
Or does that sound plausible to you? You see, there's no sense going further with a bunch more questions if he isn't willing to give consideration to this first thing. Now, it might be that you do the best you can and the guy says, you know what, uh, that doesn't satisfy me, but it looks like we're going to disagree on this, so let's just move on to something else. Fine. You do the best that you can. You're not going to satisfy everybody in this kind of conversation. Also, don't take unfair advantage of the time that you buy when you're talking with him about this. Get the opportunity, make your point, let him back into the conversation. Remember, steamrollers are people who have a hard time waiting. So you're asking him to do something against his nature by not jumping in on you, so keep that in mind. And do not become a steamroller yourself, all right? Give the other side a fair chance to make their point, to offer their reply before you jump in again. I find myself, I've been doing this a long time, I find myself still having the tendency to jump in when I hear something that I know I can respond to. Instead, I've got to settle back, take a breath, and listen. Pay attention. Make sure I understand their view correctly. Even give it a beat after they're done talking so they're finished their comment. I'm not laying on, on top of them right at the end of their comment. I'm, I'm coming in a little bit more slowly. I'm pausing. Whenever you pause like that after they've spoken, it, it reinforces for them that you're taking their point of view seriously, all right? So that's the first step. You stop them. Negotiate a, uh, um, a, a little thing with them that allows you to finish your point before they jump in, and then you pass the ball to them, so to speak, okay? Sometimes that doesn't work. So what you have to do is go to... Uh, I have a couple of comments. Uh, okay. How many of you have ever encountered a steamroller? Now you didn't know, you, you didn't call it that because you didn't know that terminology until you read this, but you've had the experience of dealing with the person that's just gonna bull you over and it's like a bull in a china closet or a shop it, and it doesn't matter what you say, they're, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna try to, try to win through, you know, power and intimidation, right? Well, his first, the first step he, ha he recommends in dealing with them is stop them, okay? This is important. This negotiated agreement, like when he says, like he gives some examples of this, right? He says, is it okay with you if I take a few moments to answer your concerns before you ask another question? I'll give you a chance to respond when I'm done. Now, if they say yes, what have you just done? What have they just done? They, they've, they've helped, they, by their own admission, they've set certain parameters around this conversation, right? So then when you get to this, if they don't follow the, the rules of the conversation, if you will, that they help negotiate, then you can do what? Hey, wait a minute here. You're, you're not, this isn't what we agreed upon, you know, um, this and that. This isn't, um, you see what I'm saying? You can kind of handle it that way and uh, make sure that they're um, following the, the, the rules. Or I, I don't like that word, but you, you understand what I'm saying. The parameters that they themselves have agreed to in the conversation, right? Let me say one more thing too. <coughs> this will work well when you're in face-to-face -face conversation with somebody. When you are on social media, uh-uh. Okay? Because people can just pile on and pile on and pile on and this and this and this and this and this and never respond to anything because it's, it's not a real face-to-face -face what? Conversation. conversation, right? So if you're going to try to, it's much more difficult to stop them and to follow this procedure when you're dealing with somebody in a virtual conversation than it is in an actual face-to-face -face conversation. Okay. Anybody have any questions or comments before we look at step two? Yeah. Um, it actually, yeah, like you said, it is easier face-to-face -face and with an audience it becomes even easier. Because when you have to go to step two shaming, now they have people actually watching them break your verbal contract. Mm -hmm. So they have to, you know, def you know, kind of save face a little bit and give you some of it because people are watching and they saw them agree with it. The other thing is when when I have somebody who piles on four or five different things all one on top of another, a good way to negotiate is asking them which one they prefer you answer first. So not trying to respond to all of them, pick one and let's deal with this one that and even give it to them which one do you think is the 
the most important one for me to answer. Let's talk about that one first and see where it goes. You know, so make them think about what they just said and make them uh, say, make them pick one for you to deal with. You've all heard the phrase, um, moving the goalposts. You know, you've heard that phrase, right? So we start out having a conversation about A. The person doesn't like how that's going, so then they switch to B. Okay? And you're really not done dealing with A yet, but now they're moving on to what? B, and, and if you're not careful, the steamroller will go all the way to Z, and you've never dealt with what? A, right? So that's what Nate's talking about, right? Well, which one of these menu of things that you have an issue with do you want me to address? You know, and, and make them say, that, that's a form of what? Negotiated, Negotiated agreement, right? And, and I, I think that it's true. So if you are in a setting where there's other people around, to have these sort of negotiated agreements is beneficial because then other people who are dropping eaves or listening or paying attention, they'll call people out too for not following the parameters of the conversation that they just heard them what? Agree to, okay? Anybody else on step one? Step two, if you can't stop them, then you have to shame them. And what I mean by shaming them is that you pretty much do the same kind of thing that you've done in the first step, but you're addressing the impolite behavior in a, a more direct fashion. So if you try step one and the steamroller breaks trust with you, with your first agreement, or maybe you can't even succeed in stopping him briefly to go to negotiate with him at all. Uh, you got to be more aggressive. Steamrollers are aggressive. You must be more aggressive too. And what you do is you shame him by being direct and asking very explicitly for courtesy in your conversation. Now make sure you're calm when you do. You don't want to come across harsh or angry. Uh, it will do you no good if you are condescending at this point. Um, take a deep breath, let them finish their point, and then first just ignore the challenge. All right? That's not your problem right now. The problem is the way the conversation is going. Don't follow the rabbit trails. How many he has put before you, regardless, just let it go. Instead, you want to address the steamroller problem directly. And you might say something like this. You know, I need to know if you really want an answer from me. Now, I assume you asked the question uh, because you wanted a response. I could be wrong about that. You keep on interrupting me. So which is it? Do you want an answer or not? You wait now for an affirmation. Uh, you might put it this way. Uh, could I ask you a favor? I'd love, love to respond to your concern, but I can't because you keep interrupting me. Do you think I can have a few moments to develop my point without being cut off here? And then, hey, you can tell me what you think. That's all right. I don't mind hearing from you. I just want to be able to, to, uh, uh, to, to, to make my case here. Is that okay with you? And then you wait for a response. Or you might say, can I ask you a quick question? I need to know whether you want an answer to your challenge or if you just want to talk. Uh, when you keep interrupting me, I get the feeling you don't want to have a dialogue. You don't want to answer. You just want to talk. Well, that's okay. I'm a good listener. Uh, fine. Just let me know what it's going to be. What do you want? I need to know that before I can continue this conversation and then wait for an answer. I remember one time I was having a conversation. I was in India <laughs> and uh, one of the Christians brought a friend of theirs to me uh, that they wanted to have me talk with about Christianity. And this person was an energetic type, really talkative, and he was a steamroller. And what happened is the more that they talked, I should put it this way, the more that I tried to talk, the more they kept interrupting me. And finally, I just sat there quietly. And they talked, and they talked, and they talked, and then they stopped. And when they were done, I said, thanks. And then I got up to walk out. <laughs> and they were, they were really uh, surprised that I was doing They said, what are you doing? Where are you going? I said, well, I, I kept trying to answer your questions. You kept interrupting me. And I suddenly realized this person doesn't want answers. They just want to talk. And... I said, okay, I'm a good listener. I can listen. And so I did. And now I listened, and now you're done talking, now I'm leaving. 
Well, that's pretty aggressive. But it needed to be aggressive with this individual because if I didn't act this aggressively, I would not have had an opportunity to communicate my point. And so when I want to get really, really bold, when it's necessary, it's not what I want, it's the circumstance, um, I might say something like this. Look, here's, here's what I have in mind. Hold on. Here's what I have in mind. How about you ask your question, you make your point, I'll listen. When you're done, I'll respond and you won't interrupt me. And when I'm done, it will be my turn to be polite and let you have your say. Now I need to know if that's okay with you because if it isn't, then this conversation is over. What would you like to do? And then you wait for a response. You see, if you had started that way, you can see that would be way, way too aggressive. But if you go through the first step and they break trust with you, and then now you're at the second step, and, and you're going to, you, if you don't do this with some people, forget about it. It's over with. At some point, the direct approach is the only thing that will save a conversation. Remember, steamrollers are strong, they're aggressive, and, the, and sometimes they have to be answered in kind. What I mean by in kind and strength and aggressiveness, not in rudeness, all right? So when that happens and you get some cooperation on this, you can return to the steamroller's original challenge or maybe any particular challenge that they brought out, but just work with one is the point. And then you address that one thing. So you might say, well, now your challenge, as I understand it, see, now you bought the time, you shamed them. So your challenge is, as I understand it, this, and then you repeat the question. So here's how I'd like to respond, and then you give your response. Once you're done, you let the other person back in. So you keep your word, all right? And again, I just want to emphasize, don't be snippy, don't be smug, just stay focused, stay pleasant, stay gracious, stay in control. Again, you may have to take a deep breath. <sighs> okay, fine. And this, by the way, is a difficult tactic to employ because you're working against your emotions when you have to confront a steamroller, all right? I understand that. It's gonna take some practice, but I'm telling you, this really works. And if you listen to the radio show that I've been doing for many, many years now, you'll notice sometimes I get a steamroller and then you can see me putting my one, two, and in a moment, three step method into play and how effective it is to stop the steamroller, take control of the conversation, and do something productive in the conversation. So I mentioned first you stop them and negotiate. If that doesn't work, then you shame them, all right? What if that doesn't work? If it, stopping them doesn't work, shaming them doesn't work, then you leave them. In other words, you don't go any further in the conversation. Did anyone have any uh, thoughts about step two before we look at step three? Now, a lot of the stuff seems like, duh. But the other part of me is like, not really. Because what he's doing is he's giving you some real clear, laid out strategies for how to deal with this kind of a person, OK? Uh, and it, it does, like he said, it does work. But you are working, if you're going to behave, if you're going to use this tactic, um, you are working against your emotions. Because your emotions are going to be the, you know, you're getting angry, you're getting irritated, you're getting frustrated because this person won't let you, you know, respond or whatever. So for you to, for you to be cool headed and so forth and deal with them on this way, um, it's not always, it's not always easy. I'll just say it that way. Okay. And he is correct about that. that you are working against your emotions to some degree, but once you've negotiated the agreement and they don't follow it, now are you within your rights to go to this step? Okay? And to go to this step means that they, they haven't changed their behavior, right? They're still doing the thing that you, that you hopefully settled with step one. But I also agree with them that if you start here and skip this, this could come across as being way too, um, you know, curt or whatever, okay? Real arrogant maybe or mean or nasty or, or, or what have you. So I feel like there's, an, there, there's a, a, a ratcheting up here till eventually, as we're going to see in a second, you just say what? This isn't going anywhere. It's not going to go anywhere. I'm leaving. I'm done. Right? Anybody have any thoughts or comments about...
All right, then we'll get three. When all else fails, you walk away. If he won't let you answer, if he won't listen politely until he's finished, then drop it. You might let him have the satisfaction of having the last word, then walk away. Wisdom dictates, in my view at least, not wasting time with this kind of fool. Let me tell you something that happened to me just a few weeks ago, actually. It was a terrible uh, steamroller incident um, by a Christian. I was, I was having this conversation with him, and he was confronting me on a particular view that he held that I didn't hold, and so he's challenging me with questions about my view, and so I'm trying to respond, and every single time that I started to give a response, he would cut me off. And so I, I, I tried to do steamroller number one. I, I couldn't do that because he was too aggressive. I had to go right away to steamroller number two. And when I did that, he cut me off again. In other words, right when I'm trying to say, hold on just a minute, um, I'm trying to answer your question, but you're not really giving me an opportunity to answer it. You keep interrupting me. Do you want an answer or don't you want an answer? I'd be glad to give you an answer, then you can jump in. I mean, that's what I wanted to say, but I got halfway through saying that, and he interrupted me. And I said, look, you're even interrupting me when I'm asking you not to interrupt me. And I realized that this is one of those situations that was never going to go right. He would not stop interrupting, no matter what I said. So I never could get any ideas out of the table for him to consider. And I realized in this circumstance, there's no sense going any further. And I just put up my hands and I just said, I, I can't continue in this conversation. That's it. And I, I turn, I told him why, because you keep interrupting and I turn and walk away. And as I was walking away, he was still firing shots at me. That's how bad it was. I think the last thing he said to me, because I was going to give him the last word, right? And he, he said, you should go back and to your room and get down on your knees and repent from your sin and pray to God, you know, that, something like that. Because my view, he saw, was a terrible sin. Anyway, it was just, it was awful. And I felt really bad afterwards. And sometimes this is just the way it goes. I mean, life is not tidy and sharing your convictions with someone, even a Christian, is not going to be tidy. And sometimes you're going to run into steamrollers and you're going to have to deal with the steamrollers. Listen, Jesus said, do not give, uh, do not, how does he put it? Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls before swine, that kind of thing. Now, I'm not saying people are dogs or swine. That is what Jesus had in mind. He's, he's using a metaphor here. There are sometimes the circumstance is such and the thing that you have to give is so valuable. It does not make any sense at all to keep feeding this to somebody who's not going to treat it with respect. Okay. Now, how do you know when that happens? Well, he made a comment there about uh, lest they turn and, and tear you to pieces and trample under feet the, the holy thing. So look, at when you're in a conversation... And the person you're talking to is about to um, trample under feet or is doing the, this trampling of the valuable thing that you're telling them. And they're about to tear you to pieces. That's the time where you realize, end of discussion, okay? That's the time where you call it quits with that individual. You don't have to fire a, a final shot over the bow. You, you don't have to make a smart aleck uh, 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 comment. You just simply say, well, th this is really not going anywhere, and I don't think it's going to ha be helpful to pursue it any further. Or you could say, I'll let you have the last word. Or you might say, we'll just agree to disagree. But the whole point is you're cutting yourself off with the conversation. Now, steamrollers may not let you go. Just like this other guy wasn't going to let me go. And I had to just turn my back and walk away. That will happen maybe 2% of the time when you, maybe five, 2 to 5% of the time when you're dealing with a steamroller. Most of the time, the technique that I just taught you is going to work, even with your spouse, okay? Uh, but you have to be really careful to be really polite. I want you to do that in every circumstance, but you better do it if it's with your spouse, okay? A whole lot more is at stake. Because you can walk away from the discussion, but you can't walk away from the relationship, all right? Um, so what did we learn in this session? We, we learned a defensive tactic called steamroller. 
Uh, we for, first learned how to recognize that, which that's not hard because steamrollers overpower you with uh, strong personalities and they interrupt all the time. I mean, that's basically it. Uh, next, we learned three steps to deal with a steamroller and put you back in control of the conversation. First, we said stop him. Okay, uh, you stop him gently, graciously, but firmly, and negotiate a quick agreement that he not speak until you're finished, okay? And that usually works. If that doesn't work, you go to step two, you shame him. That is, you do the same thing as the first step, but you address in a very direct way the, uh, the, the, the rudeness, really, and, and you make a request for courtesy. Okay, and there's lots of different ways that I role model that for you. If you can't stop them, and if you can't shame them, then you leave them. Let them have the last word, then you walk away. That is going to be the best way to deal with that kind of steamroller. Now, I think what we've done, I just want to look for a moment over the last few sessions, the weeks that we've had together. I made a promise to you that I'd give you a game. All right, before we uh, look at his summation here, just a couple comments about uh, three. If you're going to go to three and leave, you need to leave. Not like kind of leave, but not leave. Right? Especially when you're dealing with a situation like in social media. I can't tell you how many times I've seen somebody say, well, I'm done. Right? But then they get back on and they say seven more things, right? And now I'm done. And then and it's just like, come on, right? If you're, if you're going to go to this step and leave then you just need to, you need to be willing to say, okay, I'm just done with that. Whatever else they're going to say, I'm not going to respond. Because the steamroller will keep what? Going and going and going and going. Okay? And piling on and this and that and this and that. And, you know, why aren't you answering me? Well, I, I told you, I'm, I'm done. But if, if you go back in and say anything, what that's signaling to the steamroller is, oh, this is still going. And they're just, they'll just keep right on going. Okay. Any comments about that? So he's going to tie everything together from the whole um, series here and with some final summation points. Plan that would allow you to converse with confidence in any situation, no matter how little you think you know, or how knowledgeable or aggressive or even obnoxious the other person happens to be. And I provided that for you in our first three sessions. It's the Colombo game plan. That is, we use questions to move through conversations. And when I say game plan, I mean that quite literally. That is, when I get into an encounter or a situation where I want to have a spiritual impact on somebody's life, I think first, what? Gather information. So I'm going to ask questions to gather information. The key question there, the model question, is what do you mean by that? It's especially helpful when people are making challenges to you of a spiritual nature and raising uh, objections of some sort. What do you mean by that? And for every ambiguity, you want to get clarification, okay? Uh, the second step in our game plan is to reverse the burden of proof, all right? So uh, if somebody makes a claim, they're the one who bears the burden of proof. We're not going to try to disprove their view. We want them first to offer evidence in, in, in favor of the point that they're trying to make before we go after it. And we use some form of the question, now how did you come to that conclusion? And then the third use of Columbo is if, we, if we, we can go further in the conversation, if we have a point that we want to make in a positive way, if we see a weakness or a flaw, then we're going to use questions to make our point or use questions to exploit the weakness or the flaw. And if we can get a bunch of pieces on the table from them by asking them questions first that help us to make our point all the better. Okay, that's the game plan. That was our first three sessions. Then we talked about two different tactics that will allow us to recognize the flaw. Uh, the tactic suicide was used to help us to recognize when some points of view just self-destruct. And they destroy themselves, so all you have to do is recognize it, and that's the key, recognizing when a view is self-contradictory. And then you point it out, and if you can point it out using questions, all the better. Uh, the second way that we discovered that we could um, uh, expose a weakness or a flaw, or I, another way of saying it is a second way that a point of view can go bad, uh, involves the taking the roof off tactic. Uh, 
That is, if you take the, the point of view seriously and agree with it for the sake of discussion and you give it a test drive and see where it goes, if it ends up someplace absurd or bizarre or radically immoral, then there's probably something wrong with where they started. And in this particular case, you want to show them the consequences of the belief that they have if they hold it consistently. You remove the protective cover, the roof, that's helped them to stay uh, clear of the natural consequences of their own view. And, uh, and then you, you encourage them to consider maybe starting from a different point, a different worldview, uh, dropping that particular view that they have. Okay. Uh, finally, we talked about a defensive tactic, and, and that tactic is the, is the, uh, the steamroller tactic, and we've talked, that, talked about that at length here in this session. I just want to offer you a, a final challenge. I mentioned that at the beginning of our sessions together that uh, this is a course that could be a, a, a game changer for you. I know that because it's been a game changer for me and for so many other people that have told me the very thing, that it's changed everything for them. I hope that you haven't been just following the sessions passively, but you've actually been starting to put these things into practice. And if you don't put them into practice, they will not help you. Okay? You can join a health club. You'll never get better. You never get healthier, you never lose any weight if you don't go. All right, same thing with this. You can learn all this stuff. If you don't start putting it into play, it's not gonna help you one bit. But if you do put it into play, you, you are gonna be amazed at, at how effective these tactics, the general tactical approach, will be in helping you to maneuver in conversations. So I want you to study the tactics. I want you to know the truth. If you're going to defend the truth tactically, you got to know what the truth is. So that's another element here. I want to encourage you to get out of your comfort zone. I realize it's not easy to engage people on spiritual topics. Look, I, I get it. But you will not find an easier way to do it than what I've just taught you. I promise you. And in the process, you can trust that the Holy Spirit is going to use you if you step forward. We don't know how that's going to be. We don't know when it's going to happen. But the Holy Spirit has an amazing way of taking whatever it is that we offer, even if it's just a stone in somebody's shoe, and using it in powerful ways in their lives. So don't be discouraged by appearances. Oh, that guy would never want to listen. Oh, that person is probably an atheist. Or that person would never consider anything I have to say. Even if they push back on you hard, you never know what God is doing in their lives. And the other thing that I, I, I want you to do is I want you to commit yourself to be a good ambassador for Christ, okay? Uh, an ambassador of knowledge, wisdom, character. Knowledge and accurately informed mind. Wisdom and artful method, tactics. Characters in an attractive manner. I want you to work at representing Christ in a winsome and an attractive fashion. And if you do that, I promise you, God and the power of the Holy Spirit will use what you put out there for Him. There is a kind of battle out there, and there are casualties. If you prepare properly, and these tactics will allow, uh, are part of that preparation, if you step out, if you trust God to work, you won't be one of the casualties. You'll be one of the people that makes a difference that bears fruit that remains. That's my prayer. Anytime I go out to engage somebody else, I hope that's your prayer as well. And I also hope that what I've offered you in these six sessions will help you to accomplish that very thing. I'm Greg Kokel for Stand to Reason. So I'm uh, just kind of curious here in the last few minutes that we have, does anybody have any general feedback about the material that we've gone over here in the last uh, seven or eight weeks? Was this helpful, beneficial? Um, was it a waste of time? Have you been practicing it? Um, anybody have any just general comments about the material here that we've gone over this summer? Yeah. I have a comment. We have a brother-in-law that likes to try to get you to argue or whatever, but he will say something like, you know, he has it figured out that, that God did create or did create things through evolution, right? And then so I would respond with trying to refute that position. So now I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say, what do you mean by that? How do you come to that conclusion? Nancy said, you got to say it like, not, what do you mean by that? But 
What do you mean? See, that's what I would say. What do you mean by that? You know, the man upstairs, right? He claims to know the Bible. He, he absolutely is totally ignorant. But what the Bible <laughs> He's a surgeon. He was a surgeon. So, I mean, he, he isn't just a nobody. But, but, but then, so, so he'll say to the man upstairs and say, he's, you know, ah, ah, ah. what do you mean by that? Right? Well, how'd you come to that conclusion? Right? Well, if he's just a man upstairs or, or whatever, then, you know, if he, however he says that, if he says, well, you know, I think, well, what's the Bible say about it, or whatever it says. So I, I think it's been helpful for me anyway. Well, that's good. And even in other other points, but I'll, 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 I won't comment on that right now. <laughs> but it, it will come up. Any, any um, anybody else? Yeah, it's uh, kind of what I was just finished about, but it's, it's helpful for, for me. And, and it's like you can get stronger and... In your communications, you get you get more better control of your emotions. You know when you get into the because that will happen. I believe without no question, the mm -hmm. steamroller and without because you know we got different certain traits and I don't want to I don't want to do that. So it's kind of cool. Okay. Good 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 taste. Um. Anybody else? You don't. I mean, you don't have to, but I don't want to leave it. Like what you said about you can join a health club, but if you don't go, it ain't gonna do anything, you know. Yeah. Want to be able to, and there's so much. It's like there's so much to remember, and, and unless you start doing it, uh, it really take that. So, do you remember at the beginning of this, about six, seven weeks ago, I had another book. It was green that I had been that I said I was going to be reading while I was going through this. It's called uh, Why Good Arguments Often Fail, or something like that. So I was, I, I never ended up using any of that stuff. That book was written in 2006. This book was written in 2009, okay? The reason I like this book so much is because it, it's not dealing with a bunch of airy-fairy head knowledge stuff and this and that. It's actually giving you, okay, here's something that you can actually use. If you'll understand this approach, this is going to, you're going to use this approach all the time, right? So you can take the doctrine, you can take the understanding that we have, and you can just use this approach as a means of talking to people about what this is, what, what, what the doctrine is, and so forth. And um, I find that to be so helpful. And I do think in some ways it's, a, it's an approach that, had, that, that was lacking. I wish I, had, I wish I knew this stuff. So I read this book in 2009 or 10, shortly after it came out. I wish I would have known it 10 years ago when I was in Bible college because I would have done so many things different in just the way that I approach things and the way that I you know, tried to engage people in conversation. And um, I'm not saying it's not inspired. It's not like I'm not being crazy here. But I am saying that it's a good tool to be able to use in dealing with people. Okay. So... Just a reminder, there is no class next week. Okay, two, <laughs> two weeks from today, uh, Fred is going to teach. And then Fred's going to teach a second time. And then Nate's going to teach the first Sunday in uh, September. And then on the 9th of September, we're going to resume our class on the King James Bible and issues related to that. Okay, So that's kind of the schedule for the next month. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>